Well, good morning, Christ Church. It is such a joy to be back with you today. I spent last weekend out on a fly fishing retreat with Eric Canfield and Amy Moran in the beautiful state of Montana. So hard to believe a week ago I was waking up out there, but here we are again, and it is great to be with you this morning. So why don't you make your way into the worship space if you're out in the commons, and let's stand together and sing our hearts to our Lord this morning, because we are glad to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to be together, and we are here to bring our joy and lift our hearts up to Him. So Jesse's already got us started. Let's clap our hands together. the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. We sing to the God who always makes a way. As he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. Accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. That's you. Sing it out. The beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out. praise our Lord because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take our place on the cross because he so loved this world. So let's sing about that together in this next song. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well. 
that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more.
we pray that those words would ring true this week, that we would be able to keep our eyes up, that we would look to you in all things, no matter what crosses our path this week, no matter what ups and downs we may experience, Lord, we may, may we give you praise for the highs, may we give you praise for the lows, because we know you are with us through everyone, through the ups and downs, Lord, through the wins and the losses, and we just pray that today, Lord, we would be able to lay our hearts at your feet and that we would feel your presence here among us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. My name is Charlie Browning. I'm the campus pastor here at Christ Church Butterfield. Yeah, you can take a seat. I, uh, we're going to stand up in a second, so we'll do a little sit down, stand up. I, I just want to say hi and welcome, especially uh, for those of you who are new uh, or who are uh, currently searching through, uh, exploring church maybe for the first time or exploring this church for the first time. I would love to say hi to you and meet you after the service. I'll be up and around here. And even if you've been a part of this church family for a long time, if it's something where I haven't gotten the chance to meet you, I would absolutely love to do that. So I just want you to know that you're welcome here. I'm so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. Wanted to spend the next couple minutes uh, getting, getting to say hi to each other. And so if you w would be willing to get back on your feet, uh, turn to the person next to you, give them a high five, a fist bump, a handshake, tell them the best thing that happened to you this week as the band leads us in a song. Go ahead and say hi to everybody. go ahead and find a seat and continue that conversation that I interrupted you in the middle of after the service. Hey, I just wanted to say again how, how happy I am that each of you are here worshiping with us this morning. I, I hope it does 
as much for you as it does for me to be uh, in the house of the Lord as we sang earlier this morning and be worshiping God together as a community. I, this, is, this is one of my favorite scripture passages and one that I'm uh, drawn to often. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And Paul's writing to the church of Thessalonica, and he says this. He says, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And it, as if you were here last week, uh, Pastor Meyer shared uh, a message about what it looks like to lift, to lift our eyes to Jesus and to lift others up for the sake of their flourishing um, and, and the communities around us. One thing that I want to celebrate that, that we capped from the last 20 weeks, we capped this past week, was, was an opportunity for us to lift this neighborhood through the food truck ministries that we've been doing out front on this lawn. If you haven't, if you didn't get a chance to be part of it, I want to show some pictures on the screen just as a celebration of what happened this past, this past uh, 20 weeks. And so over the course of 20 weeks, we had an average of 100 people step foot on that front yard in, in some weeks up to 250 people with over 40 different food truck vendors all for the sake of spending time together, playing games, having great tacos, and getting to fellowship. And that, that was our, our, our one step out saying, what would it look like for us to try to lift up this community, for us to outreach to this community, for us to care about this neighborhood in a way that shows God's love and grace, the gospel of God to them. But not only do that, but also share our lives with them as well, that, that we highly desire to lift them through a relationship, through building relationships with people in this neighborhood, people in this community, that they would get to see Jesus through us. And I, and I just wanted to celebrate and say thank you to all the people who were a part of putting that on for the so many people in the neighborhood who showed up and who stepped foot on that front lawn. And I hope that it's, it's the first tiny step in a, in, a, in, in a journey that's still ahead as we look to reach that neighborhood and to lift it up as we lift up Jesus in the midst of that. Can I, would you pray with me for the neighborhood, um, for this continued effort to reach them and to show Jesus to those who live outside of these walls and surround us in the streets and neighborhoods beyond? God, we pray for the Butterfield neighborhood beyond the walls of this church. We lift up every person who stepped on our lawn this summer. We pray that they would have been encouraged and that they would have sensed your presence in a way that makes them desire to take another step into the life of this church. And I pray for those in the neighborhood who didn't make it to the food trucks this summer. Would you provide a way for us to reach and engage them as well? Lord, we thank you for all of the time and effort that so many people, staff and volunteers alike, Putting, put into making this neighborhood outreach so glorifying to you. Amen. Well, if you're, if you're new to the church or if you um, have if maybe felt disconnected for a little while, I wanted to share with you three, three specific announcements um, that, that may be relevant to you all this summer. The first is um, we, we just kicked off this past week a small group study called Rooted. It's a 10-week curriculum that we're going through as an entire Christ Church, both campuses, our Oak Brook campus and our Butterfield campus. And the, and the Rooted curriculum, it's a 10-week small group study that we're intentionally diving deeper in our faith and experiencing and practicing it in ways of sharing stories with each other, of serving, of taking communion, and so many others. And so we're so excited. We did week one last week, just kind of the introductory week. Just because we did week one doesn't mean that you still can't join. That's the perfect on-ramp to life into this church and to join a, a, a smaller group and kick off the fall as we dive deeper in our faith. And so you can follow the prompts on the screen. There's also a sign-up. If you're a paper person, there's a sign-up sheet outside of the commons area. We would love for you to take that step. We have groups that meet here on Wednesday nights at the church, and then we have groups that meet outside of that on Zoom and on other nights of the week in people's homes and around. And so would love, love, love again if you feel called to that for you to get plugged in and connected in that way. I think it's going to be a really exciting and deep diving adventure for us as a church as a whole. 
Second announcement. We're starting a, relation, a remarkable relationship series this morning. I, I can't tell you how excited I am for, for what the, our preaching team and our teaching team is going to share for us with us over the course of the next coming weeks. Uh, I, if, you're, if you're anything like me, you've noticed that some of the relationships in maybe your own life or, or those in the life around you have been strained a little bit by the last couple of years, um, that, that it's maybe a little bit harder to engage in certain relationships than it was a few years ago. And so this series is aimed at tackling just that, that, it, that it's, it's looking at the scriptures and looking at Jesus and say, what would it look like for us to have remarkable relationships again? One of the ways that we're going to do that outside of Sunday mornings is that we have a relation, remarkable relationships, that's a tongue twister, devotional for you to engage in throughout the week. And so there's an opportunity to, to subscribe to that devotional, then you can follow the, the promptings on the screen, and, and you can kind of follow along with us as we engage in this series about relationships. Third announcement. We're really excited about this as a church. I want to share with you a little about, about philanthropy, Philanthrocorp. Um, I, I would imagine that, that many of us, if you're like me, give attention to the details of our daily schedule, um, that, that you're mostly focused on what's coming up right ahead of me. What's today going to look like? What's this week going to look like? And that, that when we do plan beyond that, we plan for things like vacations, because that's exciting. We look forward to vacations, so we plan those with great care. And we, and we even get as far as planning towards our retirement, thinking far out and thinking, what is, how can we in a detailed way plan towards our retirement? But, but I think that many of us don't necessarily um, think about what it looks like to leave a legacy after we're gone from this earth. So about a year ago, Christ Church was made aware of a Christian estate planning firm called Philanthrocorp. And, and they're a team that partners with churches throughout the country to help people with estate planning. And so Christ Church, as a church, we've partnered with them so that you could get the gift of competent, confidential planning. Um, it's a chance to make sure that your estate is set for generations to come. Um, this, is, this is a no strings attached thing. We specifically contracted with an outside firm so that it wasn't something that's associated with Christ Church. It wasn't something um, that where there are strings attached. We simply want to give our congregants the gift of having the ability to sit down and think about what it looks like a, to leave a legacy beyond your time being here. And so if you want to learn more about that, you can follow the prompts on the screen. The, those in our church who have already gone through it, the feedback is incredibly positive about the impact that it's made in their own life and how they've benefited and how they hope future generations can benefit from the fact of getting to sit down with experts and think about what it looks like to leave a legacy beyond their life here. And so I hope that you would take advantage of that. It's such a gift that the church is offering um, as well. I'm going to transition now, and I want to invite a friend of mine and a friend of, of our church a member, Sharon Mariner, to come up on the stage with me. Um, and she's going to share a little bit of news about uh, a family that's close to many of us in the church. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Or just wait. There it is. There it is. Um, I've been asked to share some news with you uh, about a precious family to us in this church family, and it's the Campfields. Um, as many of you, of you may have known, Eric, um, our beloved pastor, Eric Campfield, his mother, Evelyn, has been in an eight-month battle with a very aggressive and relentless cancer that just hasn't let up. And within this past week, she um, grew uncomfortably ill, and within um, a short amount of time, they had received news that the cancer had now shown up in her spine. And as you can imagine, um, Les, Eric's dad, and Evelyn had a tough decision ahead of them with that. And um, they came to the conclusion that Evelyn was tired and enough was enough. So on Sunday, they um, brought Evelyn home to on hospice care. And um, Eric and Sue Ann were able to be, uh, join the family and have some precious times together in those moments. And um, on Wednesday, 
amidst, uh, Wednesday night amidst a family time of looking at photos and laughing over memories, um, Evelyn took her last breath and very peacefully went to be with our Lord Jesus. Um, and so we wanted to share that news with you um, and just hold their family, family tenderly in our hearts as they go through this time ahead. And as you know, you may know, Sue Ann Camfield is just a gifted orator. She's a writer and she's so gifted at that. And she has um, written the final Caring Bridge entry um, for her mother-in-law. And I wanna just share her words because I could never, never do honor and justice to the, um, the moments they're having like Sue Ann can. So she writes this, she says, while our hearts grieve, we take solace in the fact that Evelyn is now at peace. She's rejoicing with the angels in the most perfect, beautiful, glorious, joy-filled place with the God of the universe who created her and the Lord of life whom she declared her savior more than 50 years ago. She is reunited with her mom and dad as well as others she's loved and lost and she would not have wanted to live any longer in the body that she had. We didn't want that for her either. So in the midst of our own grief, we rejoice. We rejoice with her. Isn't that the mysterious beauty of the hope we have in Christ Jesus? Praise God for that hope and praise God for their hearts, right? For the witness that this is, um, that they've always been in our lives. Eric has always been a champion for prayer. It's a part of um, the relationship I've always loved with him and his family is he honors and values prayer, relationship with our Father. Our prayer team has been praying over requests from he and Sue Ann over this whole journey with Evelyn and her fight with cancer. So what a better way than now to corporately join. And would you uh, join me in prayer over this family that we so tenderly love? Let's bow our heads. Good Father, it is who you are. You are good. In all things, Lord, you are the mighty provider, the healer, the lover, and the one who holds our lives tenderly in your loving arms. Father, in these last days, Lord, it has been apparent that you have been very present in this family's life more than ever. I thank you, Lord, for the journey they've had with you I thank you for the seeds they planted and the legacy that Les and Evelyn have greatly bestowed into Eric and his family's life and love for you. Father, we praise you that Evelyn rejoices with you. We praise you that she is whole. Lord, we ask you to just blanket this family in your supernatural way. Father, in a way that's new, in a way that's refreshing, in a way that's surprising, in a way that's inspiring and ever-changing and transforming over this family right now. God, Eric is a man who loves you. He is your son. And we thank you, Father, for your unabashedly just overflowing love over him. Father, Holy Spirit, be present in these days ahead in a way that they've not experienced you yet. We thank you, Father, for the hope that is, Jesus, and all that you've done for us, that we can, Lord, in these moments of struggle and pain, we can rejoice. And we are hopeful because you are faithful and you are good. Bless them, Lord. Love them deeply. And may they feel the love of their family as they are away. We pray all these things in your son, Jesus, powerful and loving name. Amen. Um, in these last days, Eric was able to have the chance to read scripture over his mother. And he um, shared with me that he was able to read Psalm 23. And it's a familiar psalm that many of us may know. But I just want to bring us back to those words and the, the version that he actually read um, from Psalm 23, the familiar words are, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the version that he had read um, with Evelyn was, the Lord is my shepherd to feed me, to guide me, and to shield me. I have all that I need. What an appropriate um, reminder as we head into a time now in our worship to offer the Lord his tithes and our offerings. Just remember, he is all that we want 
to feed us, to guide us, to lead us, to love us. So let's take that posture as we come into this moment, as we offer the Lord his tithes and our offerings. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm. But I won't go down I hear your voice Crying in the rhythm of the wind To call me out You would cross an ocean So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now You are just Forget how I feel right now on the mountaintop. I could see so clear what it's all about. So stay by my side when the sun goes down. I know who I am And I know what you've spoken I'm already loved More than I could imagine And that is enough I'm already loved Would you stand and sing? I'm already chosen
I want to begin with you today a series of reflections on what the Bible has to say about building truly remarkable relationships. Listen, if you would, to this very familiar passage from the writings of St. Paul. And now he writes, I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it's going to pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, but one day we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, but one day we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. In the end, nothing matters more in life than the quality of our relationships. Isn't that so? We can have good looks, fine health, a steady job, maybe even fame or fortune. But if we've not developed an ability to relate very well to God or to the human beings that are around us, is this really success in the richest sense? The truth, of course, is that a lot of us have grown somewhat accustomed, maybe even resigned to, regular relationships. Some of them are healthy enough for our purposes, I suppose, but we've sort of come to expect a fair amount of disappointment, frustration, and conflict in our connections with other people. We've gotten used to the emotional distance or the secret griping or the restless dissatisfaction that characterizes more of the relationships in our lives than maybe we're talking openly about. Now and then, I think, we catch a glimpse of people who seem to have found something even more, something more excellent, something better. Maybe you see a marriage that's not simply surviving, but truly thriving. Perhaps you witness an unusual intimacy between a parent and a child. Maybe you admire the fabulous dynamic that exists between the members of a team or between best friends or a set of, of siblings that are especially close. It might even be an unusually life-giving link between a, a student and a teacher or a coach or a mentor. When I see this kind of connection, I often wonder, What's going on there? How did those people get that kind of bond? 
And is it possible, is it, is it actually still possible for that kind of more excellent experience to become mine? God says it is possible, and I can help you with that. No matter how difficult the relationship is now, no matter how far away a better kind of experience seems to be, I can help you rise above the regular, says God. I can help you rise like a kite soaring above the clouds. It's not going to happen overnight. But I can provide the principles. I can give you the practices. I can supply the power that you need to lift you where you want to go. This is the first and most important principle that the Bible lays down about progress in the quality of our connections with one another. And the key idea I really hope you'll lock into is that God is our ultimate pattern and provider when it comes to building truly remarkable relationships. And this is really what Jesus is getting at when he says at one point to his disciples, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to sort of just reach around and grab around and pull out any principles and practices when it comes to relationships. I want you to model your relationships on the way I relate to people. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The way that I relate to others is the pattern you need to study and I hope you will imitate. This is the message Jesus gives to his followers. I would probably go so far as to say personally that at the core of any great marriage or any terrific family or friendship or team or mentoring relationship, you will find people who are relating to one another in ways previously patterned or directed by God, even if the people in that circle don't consciously recognize the source. It's this particular way of relating that we're going to unpack together over the next several weeks. And I hope you're up for that adventure. Before you answer that question too blithely, I, I have to warn you that the second key to developing more remarkable relationships is a particularly challenging one. And it gets described in our scripture text for today. Reflecting on the path that led him to the better life that we're talking about here, the Apostle Paul writes, When I was a child, I talked and thought and reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put childish ways behind me. What Paul, I think, is really saying here is that if you're seriously interested in developing better relationships than the ones you have today, then you need to grow up. Or maybe a better way of putting it is, you need to finish growing up. In my clearest moments, I know this is true for me. Uh, sometimes I think that the self that I bring to my relationships is a little bit like a ball of kite string that's gotten pretty tight and tangled. And I think, in fact, it got tangled that way and tight when I was young. Uh, we don't have time for me to describe all of the experiences that, that got me wound up in the way I know I'm sometimes deeply wound up. You'd be bored by all of that. I couldn't afford your therapy uh, prices. All I can say is that God keeps showing me that even as old as I am, I can still be pretty wound up in my perceptions of myself or of other people. I can still be pretty knotted tight in my ways of handling the people and the problems around about me. My current self, in a sense, is the string that limits the height of the kite of my relationships. In other words, I'll never rise to the level of marriage or parenting or friendship or even leadership that I want until I recognize even more clearly those childish ways that are limiting my relationships. I want to just stress that. I don't mean childlike. Childlike's good. It's childish that's the problem. These ways of limiting my relationships. 
And until I sort of understand how I've gotten stuck and entangled, and, and until I get God's help with this and put those ways behind me, I can't rise to the levels that I want to. And this is the task for all of us. But we've got to finish growing up. A lot of people, of course, think they've already grown up. Uh, to paraphrase Paul in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, they think, hey, look at what a great communicator I've become. Look at the way I can talk and teach and preach to other people. Look at how knowledgeable I am about the Word of God and other things in life. Look at all my faithful attendance at church and my giving to the needy and all the sacrifices I've made along the way. Even many non-religious people measure their maturity by how articulate, educated, faithful, or charitably active they are. Now these are, of course, very commendable qualities. We, we need, actually need more people with these sorts of qualities. But they aren't the measure of maturity in God's eyes. They're not what enable us to build truly remarkable relationships. I hope you'll listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. It's the third key principle that I'm hoping we're going to grasp today. The ultimate mark of maturity, of your maturity, mine, anybody that we know, is the length and the strength of the heartstring of love that runs out from ourselves toward the lives of others. Jesus says that to love God and to love your neighbor are the most important commandments of the Bible. Paul says that love is the greatest gift and it's the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. You want to know about the presence of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life? Pay attention to the length and the strength of their heartstring towards other people. Love is the clear sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. The Apostle John says that the essence of God and of those people that God truly indwells is love. It's not being smarter. It's not being more active. It's love. In fact, says Paul, I can be mature in all of the other ways that this world values and certainly needs. But if I have not love, he says in 1 Corinthians 13, if the preeminent quality that I bring to the relationships of my life is not love, then I gain nothing, says Paul. I am nothing. My life doesn't amount to all that much in the end. So either by point or counterpoint, I guess I'm reminded of this every time somebody's life comes to an end. As I've shared with you before, like most pastors, I, I probably spend a statistically unusual amount of time at funerals and at gravesides. Along the way, I've buried multimillionaires and pretty penniless people alike. But what's absolutely clearest, clearest in that particular moment when we're putting the remains of somebody in the ground is that what mattered most about that person's life is not whether or not he or she was a good talker or a good thinker or a good religionist or even a good citizen as wonderful as all those things are. What so obviously counts most in the end to everybody present on that day is the length and the strength of the heartstring that ran out from that person's life towards others. It's the way that person's love made him or her remarkable and the way it lifted up people around them or it didn't. This is the fourth principle that I want to lay down for us today and which the Bible so passionately declares. Almost everything else we spend our lives growing, constructing, chasing as the mark of our success will cease. It will be stilled or it will pass away. But love lasts. Love lasts like nothing else. 
And if you want to make a lasting imprint on this world, uh, sure, get a great education so that you can understand people. Build a business that employs lots of people. Maintain a house that can shelter people. Give to causes that assist people. But above all else, resolve to put behind you whatever childish or selfish mindsets or addictions or patterns of living that are hindering you from loving people like God loves you. Because it will be this more than anything else that lasts. Isn't this why some of the key mentors in our lives remain so luminous to us, even often after they're no longer around? <laughs> and some of us were blessed to have a, a, a parent or a grandparent who, who loved us, however imperfectly, in a remarkable way, in a way that was something like God. I think of my granny, died at 93. Uh, she loved me fiercely, which is to say that she sometimes smacked me upside the head and really challenged me. But man, I always knew she was so totally for me. And she showed that in so many important ways. Some of you probably had a, a teacher or a coach who related to you in this exceptional kind of way. I, I think of a, a guy in my life who uh, could say some very challenging things to me at times, but because he had built such a foundation of love in me, he had shown in so many different ways that he, that he got me, he saw my gifts, he was for me. I was eager to take the correction. I was happy to take the, the challenges that he gave me. Who have been some of those kinds of people in your life who have loved you in a remarkable kind of way. Chances are this person was patient and kind to you when it must have been hard to be either of those things. Chances are they were rarely boastful or particularly proud about their own accomplishments, but actually somehow took their greater joy from seeing us achieve. I have a best friend who I play golf with and he is a superb athlete. He's much, much better at this game than I am. And, and yet when we go out there, the constant theme of our, of our connection, it seems to me in our conversation, is his, his delight when I occasionally hit that great shot. <laughs> his, 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 his enjoyment of seeing me uh, learning and growing and getting better at something. Mentors are like this. They're, they're often selfless. They're often slow to anger toward us. They are amazingly able to forget the long list of times we simply got things wrong. They don't delight in the evil that befalls us as a consequence of our missteps, but rather they rejoice when we finally face the truth. And the best of these people in our lives, in your life, protected you, they trusted God's work in you. They never stopped hoping for you. They persevered in their love for you. And their love did not fail. This kind of love, if you've ever experienced it, was not only remarkable in itself, I bet it made a mark on you. When we're loved like this, it teaches us something about how to love so that we can then remark the lives of others with a love like this. And even if we did not or you did not know such love, even if the absence of these experiences that we've been talking about brings pain to our hearts, it's only because we know so deeply how much every person desperately needs to be loved with a love like God's. So think of the person in your life who you're struggling with right now. Maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's somebody in your home. Maybe it's somebody in your church. Maybe it's somebody in your wider family or social network. And just remember, they may be the way they are, they may be treating you the way they are because deep inside they, they just not have, have not experienced what it means 
to be loved with a love like God that transforms them in the most remarkable kind of way. So that's what we're going to go after together in these weeks ahead. We're going to find together those important principles and practices that, that, that are the very power of God that can help us to grow up even further than we have. And like the greatest mentor in the universe, God is going to help us take that merely regular heart we may now have, that, that maybe tangled heart, those merely regular relationships we may now be in. And he's going to lift them to the level of remarkable as we open ourselves up afresh to him. Would you do that with me as we come to him now in prayer? Lord Jesus, you once gave your followers a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. We thank you this day for the way you have demonstrated that amazing love for people throughout your earthly journey and so supremely upon the cross. We praise you that by your Holy Spirit, your love continues to move around and within and through us. We thank you for the unusual people that you have used to be a conduit of your love in our lives. Now fill us up afresh with yourself, we pray, and send us forth to love the people around us in an even more remarkable way. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. One of the things that we're going to do as part of this series is, is after every message, um, allow just a minute or two. It's, an, it's, such an, it's such an immensely practical series that we're going through. So we're just going to allow a minute or two for reflection as part of our time of worship. And so if you have, or if there are note cards and a pen sitting around you and you're someone that likes writing things down, you can absolutely grab them. Um, if you're someone that's uh, an internal processor, and you want to just sit with these reflection questions, please do. But I, as, as we, as we uh, enter into our last time of worship, I would love for you to just reflect on these two questions. The first one is, what's the one relationship that you want to invest in during this season? Who's that one person? What's that one relationship that you want to invest in this season? And the second one is, what's one practical step you can take to make your love more remarkable? How do, how do you move forward in allowing God to make your love, the love that you show others, more remarkable? So two reflection questions. What's one relationship you want to invest in? And what's one step you can take to make your love rem more remarkable?
The scriptures promise that love never fails. What a beautiful, beautiful, resting assuredly promise. Um, the love of God never fails, that that's something that we can always lean on. And that, that an investment in love, an investment in how we can live that out, how we can reflect the love of God in our relationships is the greatest investment that we can run after. And so I pray that this week and today as we go forward, that we would desire to run hard after what it looks like to be a people that show God's love in our relationships moving forward. Go in peace. Have a great week.